Uh, yes, Charles is not there, so we'll answer his question later. Uh, Kennedy, please go ahead. You have a question? I see your hand raised. Yeah, yeah I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, I, I, I find it very interesting with the appointment of the elders, deacons, we discuss a lot of about we discuss a lot about spirituality, the moral uprightness. But uh, what about the issue of remuneration? How are they paid? Or what criteria was used to suggest how to pay them? Or are they being paid, or they were just volunteers? Because I know, like a case of Lydia, Lydia was a fairly wealthy lady, so maybe I think on her part she did volunteer. What about the others? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kennedy. So uh, your question is, um, what about uh, denominations? What about denomination? How are they being? Okay. Are they being paid? Are they drawing? Are they drawing any stipend? You know? Okay. Are they on salary? Uh, are they being paid? What? That's your question. What I'm asking is, were they being huh. paid? If they are being paid, what was the criteria that was used to decide how much to pay somebody? Because they, 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 they were church workers. Okay, okay, okay. Or, I understood. Or, 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 yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Okay. And uh, Kennedy, your question is specific to the early church. Exactly. Yeah, yeah the early church. Early church. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for uh, that question. Okay, so uh, to answer Kennedy's question, I'll share from what I know, you know, I'm, I'm sure there must be a lot more information about this, but we don't see any uh, specific payment uh, as such being uh, talked about, uh, you know, in the book of Acts, we uh, see that believers were helping one another, the church was also helping uh, the believers, so there must have been some system of providing for the needs of the leaders as well. Okay, so that is my assumption from the book of Acts. But as you study, you know, later on, uh, there are uh, uh, references where we know that uh, uh, Paul, Paul was a tent maker. So he had his income by uh, earning through a certain profession. You have people with uh, Paul also, I think it's Akala and Priscilla, they were also tent makers. So uh, it's possible that the church was helping uh, leaders through some uh, financial aid. Uh, but at the same time, we know that there were some elders who had an income through their work, their labor as well. Kennedy, yeah. So I think both ways, that, that's how they were supported. OK, OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, sure, sure. No problem. Uh, and you know, like you, uh, there, I think there are so many examples. You have uh, people like, uh, who's this, Lydia. She was a wealthy woman, I think in, the, in, the, in Philippi. And uh, because she was wealthy, she was taking care of the church there. Uh, and she would have been able to support uh, and these kind of wealthy people in different places or those who are willing to give, they would have supported uh, Paul's ministry, other people's ministry. And Paul writes about them, right? He talks about so many brothers and sisters, co-workers. So support would have come in from different places in different ways, for sure. Uh, and, and that's how the early church managed uh, taking care of the elders. Yeah, very, very good question there, Kennedy. Thanks for that. Yes. So uh, I don't know if Charles is back yet. Uh, but let me, <coughs> oh yeah, Charles is here. Okay. So uh, Charles, uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, there was Judas and Silas who were also sent along with Paul and Barnabas to the church of Antioch. And I told you that this is an interesting church because we can do an entire study uh, on this church you know uh, there are so many unique features uh, in this church uh, one unique feature being the emergence of team ministry okay so the elders of jerusalem would have sent these people 
like Paul, Barnabas, uh, Judas, Silas, very strategically. Okay, now we know what kind of ministry Paul and Barnabas were engaged in. Like they were teachers and, uh, you know, they were also apostles. Uh, I don't know too much about Judas, but I know that Silas also had, uh, Silas also had apostolic ministry. Okay, so depending on uh, what grace each person carried and what the church needed, the elders would have made that connection. And that is the reason, you know, these people were selected to send to the church of Antioch. Okay, and I, I hope that helps. Is that okay, Charles? It's okay, Pastor. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, so let's continue. So we've seen till the appointment of elders so far. Uh, an elder comes from that, uh, we can relate to the word presbyter. Okay, that is an elder. Okay, we've seen that much. Now, coming to a leadership team. Uh, we've seen the Jerusalem Council of uh, Acts 15. Now let's see further. You know what are the other categories of leaders uh, that emerge in the early church? Uh, in Acts chapter 20, when Paul, uh, you know, he he appoints elders uh, in the church of Ephesus, uh, he makes a mention of a word. He says that. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers, okay? Uh, and notice, whenever leaders were appointed, they were appointed prayerfully, okay? Whenever uh, people were sent into a certain ministry, they were it was done very prayerfully by the early church. So he says that there are some people who are appointed as elders, uh, sorry, overseers, okay, overseers uh, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So he is talking about, primarily talking about spiritual ministry over the church. And he does not want to leave the church of Ephesus. You would also study that uh, he had labored hard to uh, um, teach the, the believers in the church of Ephesus. So he didn't want them to, to you know, after he's gone, uh, they lose their faith. And, you know, they basically, as an apostle, he wanted to ensure continuity of the church, growth of the church, right, uh, maturity of the church. So uh, he realizes that God has, uh, through the Holy Spirit, given certain leaders over churches and when we appoint them they can continue to shepherd the church you know shepherding is a is a term uh, that is inclusive of uh, teaching nurturing equipping protecting providing so many things just the way a shepherd takes care of uh, his sheep who uh, you know sheep are generally known to be very dependent and very uh, innocent who cannot take care of themselves but a shepherd does that for them so uh, paul knew that he must ensure uh, there are such shepherds over the church who will provide oversight so there is uh, this new category overseers uh, that you 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 um, read about and this term overseers again in the greek if you look it up it is from the word called episcopos okay episcopos is the word from which you get the term bishop okay bishop now so far we talked about deacons presbyter or elder and uh, while uh, you know there is ministry done by these two categories more specifically, when we talk about uh, uh, the bishop coming from the term episcopos, overseers, uh, we are talking in terms of spiritual ministry, okay, primarily spiritual ministry, overseeing the church in a spiritual manner. So these bishops are, in other words, actually, you could interchangeably use the term pastor for the term bishop because what does a bishop actually do as for uh, leaders like Paul spiritual oversight over the congregation so you see the emergence of a new category of leadership uh, that is the bishops 
and in the new testament you know uh, uh, these bishops as paul writes to uh, timothy for the selection of uh, elders deacons and obviously even the bishop has to have that same characteristic he says that they must be spiritually mature they must be able to a uh, minister spiritually what is minister spiritually meaning labor uh, in the word labor in the doctrine okay uh, and have spiritual oversight protect the sheep guard them from wrong teaching okay continue to uh, preserve them in the things of god so spiritual maturity again spiritual maturity has to do with uh, um, you know the the kind of character that we develop Uh, in our walk with the lord so uh, uh, an overseer or a bishop must be spiritually mature okay or uh, in other words you you might want to say who can be an example right to the people that uh, he or she is leading so that is spiritual maturity so these are the requirements uh, for a, a bishop or a pastor and uh, you would notice that paul tells timothy to select even deacons elders keeping this in mind that they must have spiritual maturity uh, they must uh, you know uh, be examples to the flock that they lead so we have seen a new category now a new category which is uh, bishops that are being appointed over congregations now the uh, we we will continue to you know look at how uh, all these categories minister and all that um, and you know what are the other other categories of leaders that will emerge uh, but now let's talk a little bit about team ministry okay now that we are noticing uh, there are so many leaders in the church uh, the early church also believed in um, ministering together so one really simple example is when uh, you have uh, uh, peter and john right uh, in the book of acts you have peter and john two of them they go uh, to different places uh, sharing the gospel pro- proclaiming preaching the the message of uh, christ uh, and all that so two of them go together uh, and in the same way you know you you find in various places there are teams there are groups paul and barnabas okay then you would see like paul and uh, he took with him silas he took with him timothy so there is group ministry happening uh, the church of antioch uh, is is a very good example of group ministry because in that church you had paul and barnabas uh, you know go and minister but uh, there are other names also that we uh, read about we read about uh, simeon we read about lucius manian Uh, uh, who are also part of that uh, church right uh, and uh, the beautiful thing is that each one of them was serving in a certain capacity so you had teachers you had uh, you know uh, prophetic teachers you have apostles so basically there's a there's a group and a team ministry which is going on and if you look at the background of all these leaders you know the church of antioch is is a good example of a multicultural church it's a good example of a church where uh, people of various backgrounds are accommodated okay uh, because uh, uh, it is like barnabas is from the uh, his background is he's from the levitical uh, you know from from that priesthood background Okay, so you would think that wow, you know, he seems to be a very uh, highly placed, honored uh, person in the community. But at the same time, you, know, you would notice that uh, there there were others who were part of the team who were probably not as uh, celebrated as Barnabas, right? Uh, and Paul is you know super educated in the team, but you have uh, different ones who were not necessarily that educated. So, but they are all working together. you know their their backgrounds don't uh, stop them from working together it's it's more about uh, you know the future of the church it's more about the growth of the church it's more about the grace which is given to each one of them so team ministry so the church of antioch is a beautiful example of uh, uh, a, a leadership uh, you know that that has uh, various people and it's group ministry that is taking place um, and uh, you know even 
uh, things like somebody is a teacher and apostle, uh, you know, uh, Agabus comes in uh, as well to minister for a while. So the fivefold ministry offices also you would see that there is that cooperation among them. So there was team ministry taking place uh, in the early churches. Now, uh, we have seen that there are groups emerging, okay, groups for the sake of ministry, for the sake of decision making, there are teams. Now, uh, as we keep progressing in the New Testament, we also observe the emergence of one key person for a local church. Okay. Uh, now, we may term this person uh, in, a, in whichever way we want, uh, but for our understanding, we would just use like a senior leader or a senior pastor, okay, uh, as that uh, name to describe this one person. Uh, so classic examples are, uh, are uh, that of, uh, uh, okay, uh, classic example is that of the Church of Ephesus. Okay. Uh, Paul is telling Timothy to appoint elders, to appoint, uh, uh, you know, bishop, to appoint uh, leaders in the church. But who is the key leader of the Church of Ephesus? It is Timothy. So Timothy is encouraged and he is held responsible for that local church. Okay, so uh, in a way, he is the senior pastor or he is the senior leader of that church. Okay, uh, and today for us, you know, it's easy to understand uh, this, uh, this structure of oh, having a senior pastor for a given church. But it was already there uh, uh, in the New Testament, right? And uh, another reference to this kind of uh, 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 you know leadership of one person overseeing a church and being responsible for the spiritual growth of the church is seen in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter two and verse one, uh, Jesus is addressing angels. He says, "Okay, to the angel." at the church at Ephesus. Now that word angel, uh, if you look up the Greek, it is angelos, which means messenger. Uh, while interpreting it, we might think that, okay, maybe every local church has an angel, uh, has a heavenly being that is supposed to take care of that church. Uh, but we know that, you know, that is not consistent with other uh, scriptures. So the only conclusion that we can draw is the angel refers to a human leader or an overseer of that particular church. So uh, in, in the book of Revelation, there are, it, the, the address is to uh, you know several such uh, angels of several churches. Right, uh, and so we realize that it is the Lord Jesus who is holding one person or one leader as the 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 uh, you know uh, holding them responsible for the life of that particular church. So uh, we we conclude that it is a senior pastor or a senior leader who is uh, uh, you know given that that role. So it's this is also something that has already uh, been there in the uh, New Testament, and we see a lot of that in our contemporary churches, where you have one particular person who is leading. Okay, and uh, uh, further in our uh, notes here, we have a section on the fivefold ministers and team ministry, and I've already uh, shared a little bit about uh, the Church of Antioch there, um, uh, and you know we we see that. All these functions are uh, uh, complementing, supporting, enriching the local church uh, without competing with one another. So there's a lot of team ministry that took place and it was a blessing for the uh, regions at that time. So uh, at this point, I think I will pause and come to our questions here. Uh, there is again a question from Charles. It says, which uh, political nation has... This Antioch now, where is this Antioch? In which country is it now? Now, uh, I think Antioch of, one second, Syria, I think so. 
Uh, I think Tarun would be the right that's person. Tarun, any Turkey? It's in Turkey. Oh yeah. Okay, Mangi has answered that question. Thank you, Mangi. So yeah. So the Antioch which we are talking about is in Turkey right now. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions so far before we go further? I thought you are, you will have a lot of questions. Uh, can I can I ask about the Presbyterian Church? Okay. Does yes, the Charles. Does the Presbyterian Church have senior pastors? Can the Presbyterian okay. Church have a senior pastor? Okay. See the very term. Presbyterian Church uh, tells us that they have a system of uh, elders overseeing the church. Okay, so uh, I don't know about the the traditional Presbyterian Church if, if there is any rule or anything, um, but uh, uh, maybe somebody else can enlighten us if you are if you know about the Presbyterian Church. But I know that it's a system of elders who oversee the church. Anyone more familiar with the, the Presbyterian Church? Um, I have some idea. Yes, um, but right, yeah, like you rightly said, uh, Pastor. Um, they have elders, um, and uh, the elders uh, need not necessarily be. Um, uh, uh, I mean, they, they they need not necessarily have done their BTH or anything as such, but just uh, members who've been there from the start or have been have shown um, uh, commitment loyalty over a certain period of time i think tenuity so based on tenuity uh, they have elders nominated um, and the elders and then then they're giving given areas basically uh, i think uh, the common format is they have area elders so each elder is given a certain area so uh, the elders responsibility to uh, take care of the congregation in that area and also then help uh, the church with different things. And I think the elders once a month, they meet together. Uh, they call it Kirk session or they call it some session, but they meet together. They make important decisions. There's normally a church secretary um, and some other functions, but the elders collectively decide on the governance uh, of the church. The pastors are there, so the pastors are not elders. Um, the pastors are uh, involved in the decision-making process. They are considered um, at par or, or maybe even one step uh, higher than the elders. Um, but the pastors would, uh, would need to have done the, the theological uh, thing. So the pastors uh, in Presbyterian churches need to um, have completed their theology and then they get to be pastors. So, yeah, a few things that I know. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Samuel. So, yeah, Charles, I think that uh, seems to be the structure. Yeah, sorry about the sneezes and the sniffles every now and then. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Also, uh, also ma'am. Um, yes, sorry. Uh, in these churches, uh, the elders are generally not chosen, but in few churches may be elected by the congregation. So they have an election kind of system and a lot of uh, political <laughs> background where they, you know, uh, they, they are chosen by elections and this kind of a system. Mm -hmm. And pastors yeah. are even transferred from like church to church. They may not be pastoring the church for a very long time, mm -hmm. which is uh, something that really um, concerns because uh, uh, for that reason, they, the, pastoring is like being connected with the congregation uh, in every area of life and helping them out. But just but because they are being transferred, they don't connect the people to that extent. Uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, they understand the needs and 
Yeah. So it's more of like uh, they they head the church, they they take the services, but uh, that then they get transferred probably to another city, another church, according okay. to their, okay. their diocese or something, whatever they call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Sabni. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you know, from your observation. Uh, so yeah, in this manner. Uh, you know, the structure uh, of uh, like different structures exist for different churches. Uh, and it's a good thing that we discuss this now because we are moving into looking at the different forms of church structure anyway. And what I want, want to say is uh, there is no uh, perfect structure. Okay. Uh, the structure needs to emerge being led by the Holy Spirit. That's what we have to keep in mind. Remember when Paul talked about overseers in Acts chapter 20, he said overseers, um, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So the method that we adopt, the structure that we adopt must be led by God. And that is the key thing. Okay. Uh, and it might look different for different churches. Now, some churches may not want to have a formal uh, uh, formal level called elders. They might just have deacons and then there might be a senior pastor and a pastoral team, right? Uh, but that's fine. Maybe that is what works for that church, but they have been led by God to adopt that structure. So the important thing is to be led by the Holy Spirit and to go with the structure uh, which you're sure God has given you uh, and that it is something that is serving the people. Okay, so we will now talk about some of the existing structures. It is not to say that, oh, this is better than that. No, that's not at all the point that we want to make. In every given structure, you know, we can see some good things, uh, but there can also be a downside to a particular structure. But we follow God uh, as he leads to keep making things better, uh, to ensure that the church can grow. Because ultimately, what is God's goal? He said that right when we talked about the, the church and the uh, mission of the church the mission of the church uh, is, is to take the gospel out to disciple the people and through the message of the church when the whole council of god's word is being preached what will happen to the people you know in uh, ephesians 4 13 we see that till everyone reaches maturity so spiritual maturity is the goal so the structure must be such that people can grow into spiritual maturity Okay, so having said this, let's look at some uh, regular patterns that we see around us. One is the clerical system. Okay, clerical system, which is uh, adapted by uh, churches like the Anglican, Methodist, Baptist, and so on. So here you have a very clear distinction between the clergy and the laity. Clergy are the people who are involved in ministry. Laity are the ones who... You know, they, they come on Sundays, they come for weekends, they come for prayer meetings, and they're gone. Like, uh, they don't necessarily engage in any kind of spiritual ministry, but they usually support the clergy financially or in other ways, you know, to continue doing the work of the ministry. Then uh, <clears throat> the uh, clergy is uh, usually uh, under uh, an era. You know, there's an hierarchy, there's a, there's a structure that is given to the uh, clergy. And uh, the way uh, Ami shared, you know, in, in some of uh, these systems, you have uh, uh, the clergy being moved from church to church. And maybe the reason why they started this is due to the uh, lack of leadership in certain regions. See, it would help, right? Like, suppose, I'm just giving you an example. If you take a remote village in Karnataka where there are no leaders, uh, if we can send somebody from our team here to go minister there, uh, it will be useful because that way you just transfer someone and say, okay, Nancy, why don't you go 
to that remote village and uh, you oversee the church in that particular place. So maybe it, it began like that, but yeah, we do see the downside now. If people are transferred quickly, uh, they're not even able to establish a relationship with the congregation and uh, even that can affect the congregation adversely. Okay, so that is a downside. And in uh, this kind of a structure, uh, we uh, see a couple of levels also. Sometimes you have bishops uh, within that uh, same, you know, like the Anglican structure. But you may also have deacons. You may also have, uh, you know, uh, uh, leaders. Uh, they can be called uh, with various terms like priest or something like that. But you do have levels of leadership as well okay, under the clerical system. So that is a system that we observe. We have seen this uh, particularly in the... Uh, you know, like uh, the 1800s, 1900s, uh, it, it, like uh, it plays European uh, churches, right? We've seen all that. And now even here in India, we have uh, these same systems uh, that exist. So more like a cler clerical system. There is a, an elder system, elder system which some churches uh, uh, adopt the structure. In this, the way Samuel pointed out, there is a group of elders. These elders are engaged in uh, decision making. They could uh, be primarily taking care of the helps and administrations, but uh, some elders could be part of the spiritual ministry as well, right? So, or in other words, you could have the bishops also who are a part of that elders team and they do the preaching, teaching, uh, uh, spiritual ministry to the church. And uh, um, uh, apparently, this this kind of a structure uh, also has been like the Presbyterian structure has been useful uh, in many places, and it has helped the growth of uh, local churches. Uh, and the challenging aspect of having a an elder system uh, could be the decision making process. Also, see the good part is decision making because you have opinions of more people, you know, prayer support of more people, then hopefully you will make the right decision. But uh, that same process can be delayed, right? Uh, because they may not have a singular vision. Um, there can be uh, slowness in, in taking a call on matters, right? You will have to wait. Oh, if there are 10 elders, then uh, before we decide, oh, should we step out uh, on missions? to XYZ place, all the 10 elders have to say yes. Okay, and that might end up taking time. So that unity, that single purpose vision, right? Uh, that can be challenging, but if the elder system has uh, fixed those loopholes and they know how to make quicker decisions uh, and they have unity of purpose, it can be a boon. It can be very, very beneficial to work with an elder system. OK, so that's a little bit about the elder system. And I know of some contemporary churches, uh, right, like some of my friends go to churches with the elder system and they, they have a founding pastor who has uh, uh, started the church. Uh, he provides leadership, but he has kind of handed it over to elders and they have, you know, branch churches where they have teams of elders. They make all the decisions. They decide, you know, who's going to preach and all. And those churches are actually doing very well. Uh, so the elder system can be a good system if there is unity, vision, and uh, uh, a method for quick decision making. Uh, okay, the next type of structure is the independent local churches. And I, I'm sure all of us are familiar with this because this is so common. So. This is led by a pastor. Uh, he usually has a pastoral team under him. What is the benefit? The benefit is uh, that you know it's independent, right? So you don't really need uh, so many permissions to establish the vision. But if the uh, independent church has a strong leader, uh, he or she establishes the vision of the church, and that is helpful because uh, when you have a singular vision, it's it's easier to move forward, okay? And hopefully, uh, the leadership is also creative enough to accommodate uh, the changes, you know, that happen along the way, uh, to accommodate the growth of the church, uh, right? So 
uh, that way this is uh, also a beneficial system things can move in one direction things can move in a creative way things can move uh, faster okay under an independent uh, system and hopefully you know the the leadership team the pastoral team is uh, are all in tune with that singular vision right and and uh, uh, that causes the uh, the growth of the church then uh, what can be some of the challenges in an independent kind of a local church you know because we are talking about one strong leader if we are not careful it's not even we if that leader personally also is not careful uh, you know it could move into uh, uh, a little bit of a uh, you know like gaining power fame kind of a dynamics uh, and if that leader is not careful it could it could end up becoming a very like a totalitarian authoritative dictatorship kind of a setup which is actually dangerous okay uh, but if the leader is is humble if the leader is accountable uh, here you know we we really believe in uh, the kingdom mindset okay the kingdom mindset having a kingdom mindset even if uh, there is a certain independent local church if that pastor is well connected to other pastors in the city uh, and you know the relationship is not just a working relationship but um, you know there are genuine friendships people can hold that leader accountable uh, for anything that he may have said wrong or done wrong or the way he treats his family it's it's a lot easier because uh, when things seem to be going down there is a mechanism that can help that leader uh, if the leader is ready to respond well uh, and new things can come back on track but if that that doesn't exist if that leader is all like oh no it's only my decision i don't want to listen to anybody i know what to do god has called me my vision you know it can move into a dangerous uh, you know dictatorship kind of a uh, uh, set up so we don't want that so that could be the downside of these independent churches another uh, downside could be that you know usually people are very happy with the main leader they have seen them lead for years uh, and they trust their leadership and maybe the leader is very skillful also now if the leader is not careful to have successors okay uh, and successors who uh, have you know he has helped those successors establish themselves while he is also in leadership if he doesn't do that what happens when he, whenever he is finishing his term there's just that emptiness okay who is going to lead next who can lead like so and so are there's nobody to lead that like, like this person okay so if there is nobody to lead if someone comes on the scene and takes over pretty well well and good but if there is nobody if nobody knows to lead from there all the work which was done in the lifetime of that one single leader you know it cannot continue or sooner or later it will crumble and fall so these are the downsides of an independent uh, kind of a structure okay so there is the good and there's also the not so good aspects of it okay hmm. yeah so i'll quickly touch on the questions here we have 10 more minutes in the early church did the elders practice monastic kind of life in order to attain spiritual maturity uh, so kennedy we don't see that uh, by monastic uh, could you explain yourself i think i know what it means but uh... I, i think this this kind of life where they they isolate themselves Mm. They live on their own. They just come to serve the people. It's like they are super beings, you know. They don't want to get involved. Like just the way you've been saying, they are friendly. They they are accountable to the others. But mm. uh, it's in the monastic kind of life you lead, but you separate yourself. You detach yourself from the congregation. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, Kennedy, for that. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, it's not uh, a monastic um, life which they led. yes they were they were conscious to keep themselves for the call of god so you would write paul writing uh, you would see 
Paul writing many times, like take heed to the ministry, you know, be serious about your call, don't let go of it. So that aspect is there, but not at the cost of completely disengaging yourself from um, society and your congregation, not like that. So monastic would be, you know, what monastic stands for. I think, no, uh, the early church did not practice that kind of leadership. I think the but, clerical uh, system did not. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, Sam, what do you say? I was thinking maybe the clerical system did. Um, we see the early Catholic, like Saint Augustine of Hippo huh. and uh, all of those. I think that yeah. time the monastic uh, was Some probably the where that the Catholic and the nuns um, mm. you know, where they would have. Yeah. So I think that that period was where uh, there was a lot of uh, mm. practice mm. of monastic uh, life, especially for bishops, deacons. Uh, Nice. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Samuel. Yeah. Some of the uh, uh, you know some of the churches earlier they did practice uh, the monastic kind of lifestyle. But uh, if you take uh, like I know the Methodist pastors and all they do get married, they do have families. So I don't think in the clerical system every church follows that, but some do. Uh, and uh, there's a question by Charles about APC, you know, what kind of a church is APC? So uh, <laughs> Tarun has uh, posted resources there. Uh, it's a non-denominational uh, church come under that category. So you could look up uh, details provided here from the website in the About Us section, Statement of Faith and uh, uh, About Us section, APC Today. Uh, and that would give you clarity on what kind of structure APC follows. Okay, moving forward, uh, network of churches. Network of churches. Uh, this is more like, you know, several churches uh, with uh, their own leaders, but they're all connected with a single vision. Uh, many of you would be familiar with uh, Assemblies of God. Uh, okay, again, Assemblies of God is not necessarily a single vision. Every church has its own vision. But they have a, uh, you know, they all uh, trace back to the, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, that happened during the Azusa Street Revival, okay, 1905. Uh, so that was the birth of the Assemblies of God. So people who believe in Holy Spirit baptism, the works of the Holy Spirit, they generally sign up with the Assemblies of God. So there's a network of churches. Okay, and it functions together. They have the gatherings, keep themselves encouraged in God. So networks exist. Vineyard is another good example. New life churches here. I have heard of new frontier churches. So you would probably know of uh, networks in your own country. Uh, some churches do it this way. And it is, again, a very useful model because there's a lot of, uh, hopefully there's a lot of accountability uh, among the various leaders. However, uh, again, if the uh, network is led by one uh, leader or a team of leaders who are not accountable to other leaders, then this too could fall in the danger of uh, coming under a, a lot of control, right? Control, competition, abuse, and things like that. So that can be the downside. So we can watch out for it. But otherwise, it's pretty uh, useful. Again, similar to the networks of churches, there are apostolic networks. Uh, apostolic networks uh, usually have a strong apostle who is leading them. And uh, they have a single vision and they quickly multiply over uh, geographical regions. Okay. Um, the good part is single vision, strong leadership, moving forward. You know, expansion of the kingdom. The downside is similar to that of independent churches and the network of churches as well, where if the leadership is not careful, uh, you know, then it can move into more of an authoritarian system, which is dangerous. Uh, and also there is one more challenge, uh, and this has happened, you know, in some apostolic networks in the past, uh, they usually use this term called covenant relationships. Okay, uh, covenant relationships are good, but the abuse of that, where you know, if you're part of a apostolic network and there are sister churches, right, and uh, uh, the the people in in that sister church uh, are 
you know you form relationships with them as okay they are covenant uh, you know brothers and sisters they may not be uh, like you know in a natural sense they are not our brothers and sisters but by covenant okay and there comes in uh, some kind of control and manipulation on the basis of that now that also is not good it has happened in certain apostolic networks and that is something to watch out for okay because uh, that seems to have more of a cultic tendency but if the town sites can be um uh, like you know if if the leaders know how to work on the town sites and keep the uh, church moving in a healthy way uh, apostolic networks are quite a beneficial structure to follow the next structure mentioned in our notes here is house churches which i know a lot of you will be familiar with and house churches is becoming very popular uh, nowadays uh, and uh, i mean i've heard of house churches even uh, in uh, a lot of developed countries the good part about house churches is the kind of fellowship when right? you get to know people closely you can grow well there's more accountability uh, you know and also maybe saving money you don't have to have the large gatherings regularly many uh, networks what they do they they have house churches and they have a one gathering once a month maybe where they all come together hundreds of people gather together like our usual church services and it's easier right because you you don't have to put in effort for that event uh, every sunday so these are all the benefits of the house church but what is the downside you know if there are multiple house churches oversight oversight of the people can become challenging because the leadership may not get receive news effectively efficiently quickly enough unless they have a very good system uh, and also doctrinally uh, since you're handing over uh, leadership and oversight to uh, a lot of these um, you know uh, overseers of the house churches uh, now are they teaching in line with what the uh, church believes sometimes it's hard to tell unless it's being reported back to the leader so accountability right accountability and oversight can be a challenge in the house churches okay uh, so i i think i won't rush uh, we we could just stop here uh, i will okay christopher is asking uh, align to pentecostal okay so christopher uh, is apc align to pentecostal if you the question is do we believe in the uh, outpouring of the the baptism in the holy spirit and the gifts of the holy spirit the answer is yes right but we do call ourselves non denominational because we don't really subscribe to a certain doctrine uh, we would like for us to believe in the whole council of the word of god okay so we are non denominational yes we do believe in the work of the holy spirit i hope that answers your question christopher okay great yes okay thank you uh, all right and uh, Samuel has a comment here. He says, "But in relation to what we are learning, I think Charles was inquiring on the church structure. I think it's more aligned along the lines of independent local churches." Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, um, Sam, you could say that it's uh, independent. Yeah, but we do have a pastoral system. Uh, okay, so there is uh, an elders element over there as well. yeah and we do have deacons or we don't call them deacons we have lots uh, you know it's a very volunteer based uh, church okay so good i think uh, it's it's good we are all thinking uh, so what i will do is i will wrap up this topic in the next uh, session uh, so if you do have questions by then please come with that we'll answer those questions we will uh, touch upon the remaining systems here and then move forward into the next uh, subject okay which is about the stages of church growth and it's extremely interesting stages of church growth that there is one amazing uh, uh, chapter on uh, church growth principles and, and that's my favorite okay so i really hope we could uh, touch on that uh, the next week um so until then uh, you know please keep your uh, keep reading thinking and also asking your questions uh, okay so for now
we will wrap up. I would like to request somebody to pray, please, uh, as we uh, you know close up for today. Anybody? Okay, Samuel, would you like to close in prayer, please? Sure, sure, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful time that you've given us. Thank you for this fellowship. Um, thank you for choosing us. Uh, thank you for uh, your calling to each one of us. We bless you. you we praise you. Uh, we cannot live uh, without giving you thanks. Uh, we are honored, blessed, and happy to be in your presence, to learn, uh, to learn and grow, uh, to um, realize your mission, uh, your calling for each of us. We thank you, Lord. Um, we bless each and every one who has attended this class. We ask you to um, guide us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to enlighten us, fill us with your wisdom, with your understanding, with your peace. We bless Pastor Nancy for um, her calling, for her mission. Uh, we ask you to guide your daughter and be with her, um, help her, equip her, um, uh, help her grow in grace and stature. Um, let your divine favor be upon her so that uh, she can guide us and uh, many other batches in your way, O oh Lord. We thank you for ABC Bible College and all the teams that are working behind making uh, this success for your glory. Uh, we thank um, you for the lives of every participants. Uh, we commit our time and the rest of our days into your hands. Uh, this and everything else we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And uh, yes, bye everyone. You have only seven minutes. So <laughs> please feel free. You can log off. God bless you. See you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Thank you Take guys. Care of, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. God bless.